So we're starting a brand new series. Um, I actually took it from the lectionary, and it's a series on Mark that I called Servants of All. Um, and we're going to be picking up midway through Mark. But because of that, I thought I'd just kind of give you a brief overview of Mark in case some of you aren't as familiar with his gospel. It's actually the second gospel reading in your New Testament. But it's considered by most scholars to be the first that was written. It's also the shortest. Most believe it was written in approximately somewhere in the decade of the 60s before the temple destruction occurred in 70 AD. And then it became the foundation for Matthew and Luke's gospels. They had read Mark and then they used that to expound upon. And so the Mark that we're talking about is actually the disciple that journeyed with Jesus who was known as John Mark. But obviously we have John's gospel, who was John, so it became known as Mark's gospel. But it's the same John Mark that is known to have journeyed with both Paul and Peter that's mentioned in the book of Acts. Now, Mark keeps his narrative very simple. There's only two parts to the way he tells Jesus' story. We have part one, which begins not with Jesus' birth at all, but just with his adult ministry. It kicks off, and we see Jesus working in and around Galilee, and he's performing miracles, and he's proving his authority over Scripture and creation. And then out of that, he's using that to teach his followers and the disciples. And that goes from the first chapter until about the middle of chapter 8. And then that's where we're going to pick up for our sermon series. We're going to be looking at chapter 8 all the way through to the end. And in that portion, what's happening there is that Jesus, and the way Mark tells the story, is putting his focus on Jerusalem and the cross and the resurrection that is to come. And we're going to pick up right where Mark does with that part of the text. So if you want to read along, I believe that it is in your bulletin. We're going to begin reading from chapter 8, verse 27 through 38. Hear now the word of God. Jesus and his disciples went into the villages near Caesarea Philippi. That's fun to say. On the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They told him, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples. The human one, also often translated the son of man, the son of Adam, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed. And then, after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, then sternly corrected Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowds together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all those who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one, will be ashamed of that person when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. The word of God for us, the people of God. And God's people say, thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit so that as the scripture has been read and your word is now proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Well, there is a lot going on in our passage for tonight. And just for fun, I'm going to add to it with some context of how it all came to be. So chapter 8 starts out with Jesus feeding 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. The disciples have no sooner finished gathering up all the leftovers, which filled seven baskets full of leftover bread, 
when the religious leaders and scholars approach him and say, Jesus, give us a sign. Jesus looks at them, sighs in exasperation, and says to them, nope, I'm not going to give you any signs. I read this when I was prepping for tonight, and it made me think of how my kids are after dinner. I'm cleaning up the dishes. I get the dishes cleaned up. I finally am ready to put the leftovers in the refrigerator, and without a doubt, one of them is going to walk in and say, Mom, is there anything to eat? And I'm going to look at them and go, nope, there's nothing to eat. Of course there were signs. Jesus wasn't saying there weren't going to be signs. Mark is filled. The first eight chapters are filled with signs and wonders proving that Jesus was who he was. And yet, Jesus also realizes that the Pharisees are not going to be able to recognize any of these signs for what they are because of their spiritual blindness. It's going to prevent them from seeing Jesus for who he is. When Jesus finishes speaking with them, he then turns to instruct his disciples, and he says, you know, spiritual blindness, it's, it's kind of like yeast. It just takes a little in a loaf to make the whole thing rise. Spiritual blindness, just a little of it, it's going to cloud everything that you see. And then as if to really make the point hit home, he then takes a blind man in Bethesda, puts mud on his eyes, and helps him to literally see. And then that's where our scripture picks up. All this talk about spiritual blindness, then he actually heals someone who's literally blind, and then they head to Caesarea Philippi for some rest and some solitude before they're about to make the journey to Jerusalem. And along the way, Jesus asks them, who do you say, or who do others say that I am? And they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say a prophet. And then he asks them, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, quick as could be, Jesus, you are the Christ. And that is a pivotal moment. That is it. That's the peak and pivotal moment in Mark. That is what everything that has been happening has been gearing us up for, that revelation. And Peter got it. And not only Peter, but the other disciples around him. Jesus had done everything, all the miracles, all the teachings, to get to the point when those who knew him best could identify him for who he really was. And now that they had this key of revelation, he was going to go on and teach them what it really meant. And he goes on to share with them how he's not just going to save Israel the way they thought, but he's on a plan to save and redeem all of humankind. So he tells them, the human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the legal experts and be killed. And then... After three days, rise from the dead. Now, Peter seems to only hear the part about rejection and death because he takes hold of Jesus like Jesus has lost his mind. And he be begins scorning, scorning him and he begins scolding him and correcting him. For the last 400 years, Israel had been waiting for God to come to come and save them from the tyranny of being oppressed by other nations. This was the kind of salvation that they had been counting on. And the kind of Messiah that they wanted was one that was going to bring military victory once and for all. And in Peter's mind, as well as the bulk of Jewish understanding at that time, a dead Messiah was no Messiah at all. How does Jesus respond to Peter? Well, he does it by looking him sternly in the eye and correcting him. Get behind me, Satan, he says. You're not thinking God's thoughts. You're thinking human thoughts. Ouch. From zero to zero in 2.7 seconds flat. I mean, seriously, just moments before Peter had declared that Jesus was the Christ, and Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, who expounds upon it, talks about how Jesus had said, you've got it. You have landed on the key 
of what is going to be the foundation and the rock upon which I'm going to build my church. And then he offers them these blessings upon Peter. You know, in the past, I've talked about those moments where you just know that you're just right where you're supposed to be. And you sense God going, good job. And it's like a holy hug. Don Wesley might have described it as our heart being warmed. It's those moments we feel close to God and we feel like we're kind of starting to get it. Well, Peter goes from this holy hug to a moment where he's being called Satan. I mean, talk about transition. We went from the hug to the two by four, like that. And suddenly he's left hurting and he's confused. And he has no idea why Jesus just did this. Now, Jesus turns him and says, Satan, meaning deceiver and tempter. And then he goes on and informs him. He doesn't understand anything about how this is all going to work. But when Jesus was doing that, it's important to understand that Jesus didn't believe that Peter had all of a sudden become possessed by Satan himself. He was referring specifically to the temptation that Peter was putting out there that Jesus could avoid the cross, that Jesus could just kind of skip over that part and the death and just work on, if he wanted the resurrection, I don't even think he heard about that. But Jesus was rebuking that temptation because that temptation ran much deeper than Peter even understood. What Peter failed to understand and what Peter couldn't see is that it wasn't the death that was propelling Jesus onward. He knew he had to die. But the resurrection was the prize that he was pressing on for. And in Peter's spiritual blindness, Peter couldn't understand why God would be doing it this way. And so Jesus rebuking him was dealing with the temptation that was coming at Jesus that he could skip over it because he could. But he was also, in the same way he had helped the blind man with the mud, trying to wipe off Peter's eyes so Peter could begin to see things the way God sees them. Now, as we think about that, it could be easy for us to start judging Peter and thinking, oh, well, I would have known better. I, I, you know, I'm a faithful Christian. When God, you know, does some weird things, I got it. I'm all good with Jesus. I follow. But think about how disorienting it must have been to be hit by that kind of holy two-by-four, the kind that leaves your head spinning. They thought Jesus was going to bring victory. And when he declared Jesus was Christ, he fully expected that since they were the 12, and Jesus said he was the Christ, he affirmed it, that that meant they were going to be military heroes. They were going to be leaders in the Lord's army. And then Jesus went on to instruct them right after that and say, no, 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 you're not going to be a hero in the world's eyes. You're going to be exactly the opposite in the world's eyes. In fact, I'm asking you to take up a cross and follow me. Those are moments when we get serious with ourselves that sometimes we too feel dazed and confused. I know that it's been that way for me, especially over the last year and especially last week. I told you I was going to share a little bit about how I'm doing with all of this. So you guys, I feel, are my family, so you're going to get to hear how I'm really doing with all of it. Nine years ago, God called Aaron and I into ministry on two separate events that we were at, two weeks apart. But I argued. I did not want to go into ministry. I had a dance studio with a junior company, and they were beautiful, and I loved what I was doing, and I was good at it, and I really didn't want to give it up. More, more than just that, though, because there was more to it. I had a lot of baggage. And who in the world wants a pastor with a lot of baggage? You know, I looked at Aaron, and his life had been much different than mine. And, you know, I'd gone from ballerina to financial service planner back to being a ballerina in artistic studio. And that's not the kind of person that goes into being a pastor. And I also had a lot of self-doubt. 
I didn't like to talk about spiritual matters in front of crowds. It made me nervous and anxious, and I never felt like I had the right answers. And, and I just, frankly, didn't want any part of it. I loved being in ministry with Aaron. We served as worship leaders and other things. But being a pastor, I didn't want to do it. So I argued for two years, and Aaron went ahead and started seminary. He's much more faithful than I. But along that way, we did pray together a lot, and God wasn't letting go, so I kept wrestling and wrestling and wrestling with this call. And so finally, I came to a place where Aaron and I both started to gain a vision for what it would look like to be a clergy couple. And that I could buy into enough. I wasn't going to have to do it alone. And if I wasn't doing it well, he could step up and we could just kind of cover each other and I wouldn't be running solo. And so I went to seminary and we had two years that we worked together as a clergy couple. That ended last week. And I sent him off to the military and I firmly believe that God has called him to be a military chaplain and he is thriving in it already. And I know that I know that I know that that is what he is called to do. But I would be lying to you if I went into this any less resistant than I did into ministry to begin with. I felt like God had pulled the rug out. You know, we, we had a vision where we're going to be a clergy couple, and now I'm running solo, and that is not the plan that I signed up for. I don't want to be a big girl and stand on my own two feet. I wanted to be a clergy couple. And so I have wrestled with God again and again and again. Did I hear wrong? Maybe I wasn't supposed to be a pastor at all, and I can just go back and have a studio. <laughs> Let's try that. But it hasn't, God hasn't given me that over the last year. What he has given me is opportunities to be encouraged by you all and opportunities to grow and opportunities to cry and to weep and to grieve the dream that I thought we were striving for. And as I have done that, God has also filled me with visions of how I might be able to stand on my own, in my own call, and still be in ministry with Aaron, just not in the same way. Maybe half the time going in two different directions. What God has also affirmed within me is that, especially as I was working on this particular sermon this week, so I chose this sermon series weeks ago, put titles together, read through the scriptures, put the titles in there, but I didn't focus on what I was going to preach. I worked on this over the last week or so as I was preparing to say goodbye to my husband for the next nine months, and what I kept hearing was Jesus' words. Who do you say that I am? And of course, I would say, well, you're the Christ. And then I would hear, well, then take up your cross and follow me. And I'm argumentative, so I'm just like, I just want a different cross. I don't want this cross. <laughs> but that's who I am. But over and over, as I knew I was going to be preaching this, I was reading the scripture. Jesus wasn't letting go. Who do you say that I am, not when you like the plan, not when you get the plan, not when you even can see what the plan might be. Who do you say that I am? Jesus, you're the Christ. Well, then quit doubting and pick up your cross. I think each and every one of us at different times in our lives is called to pick up a cross and to follow Jesus. But here's the thing that we miss when we're struggling with picking up that cross. Before we take those steps and have to live into it, all we can see is the suffering or the things that we don't want, or at least that's what clouds my vision. But the moment we pick up our cross and start journeying with Jesus, we learn that we are journeying towards so much more. Just like Christ had to go through the crucifixion to get to the resurrection, we have to carry our cross to get to the real life that is waiting for us. And that real life is filled with peace and hope and joy and renewal that this world cannot 
offer. And so sometimes we are asked to deny our most favorite dreams in order to go after the thing that God created or needs us to go after. But the beauty of it is when we do that, resurrection will take hold. Sometimes it's literal. Sometimes we journey with people to death and we have the hope of the resurrection. But other times, so many other times, when we are asked to carry our cross, we are looking for the resurrection power to take root here and now as relationships that have been fractured are reconciled and addictions are overcome. And people find a place within a community when they thought that they were totally isolated and alone and never would be accepted. People find new hope when we pick up our cross. And people who are willing to join us in that journey will then share that hope with someone else and someone else and someone else and resurrection takes hold. The life that we long for is one that is filled with connection to God, feeling connected to ourselves, and being connected to God's people. And we can't find that out there in the world. Even if we have gifts and things that we're really good at, it's not going to fill that the way following Christ will. And that's true for us as individuals, and it's true for us as a church. There are times that we are asked to let go of the things that we have loved doing the way we've been doing it to do something we don't get or understand or even want to do. But if we are willing to pick up that cross and trust that Jesus really is the Christ who brings about new life and redemption and resurrection in and in everything, he can make all things new, then we will pick it up and follow where Jesus leads. There's always a risk. But the beautiful thing is, is we don't take those journeys alone. We don't. When Jesus had to carry his cross, when he was preparing to go to Jerusalem, he went with his 12 disciples. And when he couldn't carry that cross anymore, someone came along and helped him get to Golgotha. We do not journey alone. We journey with one another. And so here's the thing. For me, while having to accept that our call has evolved, and God has changed the idea that we were going to be a clergy couple. While that felt like a holy two by four, and may still at times, here's what I've discovered as I dove into the scripture this week and really prayed about how I'm going to do this. How am I going to pick up this cross and do this well? In my prayer time, Jesus was talking to me because that's how we roll. And he said, you know, I told you you were going to have a partner in ministry. And he had Aaron as a partner for a while, but you are not in this ministry alone. Every time I show up here and I preach, I do not do it alone. Nothing I do is alone. I am surrounded by a community that has done nothing but support us and pour their love out over us and pray for us and check in with me to see how I am doing. And I am not alone. I'm not. And that is giving me the strength to press onward, not just for the next nine months, but to really allow God to shape my call and let me be a pastor who's going to move every three years to I don't know where, but to trust that God has a plan, even though I don't see it. And maybe sometimes I won't like it, but if I will live into it, that is where real life is. And my hope is that as a community Whatever God is calling you to do as an individual, that you will know you are surrounded by others who will journey with you. So if you need help picking up your cross, let us help you so that you can do it and embrace the life that God has for you and live into the created purpose God has for you. And as a community, as a church, we need to be prayerfully discerning where God is leading us next and to be willing to take up that cross together 
and go. I believe we can do it because God goes before us. God journeys with us, and God comes behind us in all things. God is never going to forsake us, and we have each other through the power of the Holy Spirit to keep putting one foot in front of the other. So when the going gets tough and Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? May we be a people that say, you are the Christ. And I, we, are following after you. May it be so. Amen.